<laughs> All right, go ahead and start. Okay, welcome everybody on behalf of the Berkeley Historical Society to our second uh, Bob Johnson led virtual walking tour. Um, we're doing it about the gourmet ghetto partly because we're currently running a um, an online exhibit about the Berkeley's fascination with food. Uh, we also have a, sections of the exhibit on display in our history center, but we haven't been able to open it to the public. Um, I'd like to encourage anyone who hasn't already discovered our Facebook Berkeley History Group uh, to uh, check that out. I, I, um, well, I, I think anyone can read it, but, um, or, but you have to apply to be a member if you want to um, you know, post things there. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, yeah, please keep yourselves muted because we you always, in, in a group this size, you always end up with somebody making, um, <laughs> accidentally making noises that are distracting. Uh, please use the chat for your questions and comments during the talk. Um, when he finishes the talk, probably I'll be um, sort of moderating uh, questions and, and calling on you. It would be best if you um, you, you raise your hand digitally. We can talk about that when the time comes. So uh, yeah, the only other thing is we just always alert you that this is being recorded. And if you don't want your name and face showing in the, um, I guess your name's gonna show regardless, but if you don't want your face showing in the recording that other people might look at later, um, you, you, you should turn off your video. Uh, so, Bob Johnson um, is best known, I suppose. Well, he's getting well known as a uh, tour guide and as the co-author of the Berkeley Walks book, which has lots of, of self-guided walking tours. So, um, oh, somebody's calling me. I will uh, mute myself and let Bob take over. Okay. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm, I'm delighted that we have such a a nice group here today. Um, we're going to take a virtual walking tour of the Berkeley Gourmet Ghetto, a name some people now want to remove, uh, but it, I guess it's all part of the cancel culture, but it seems to be stuck um, in, the, um, in the common usage. Um, and um, I don't know if you just say, the North Shattuck commercial area doesn't sound nearly as exciting. So maybe they'll come up with another name. I do strongly recommend that you check out the, the uh, Berkeley Historical web, uh, Society website for the, the Berkeley's fascination with food. Um, there's, there's a lot of delightful info, uh, commentaries and images about the history of food in our fair city. And it, it was quite useful for me for getting a few extra things to add into uh, today's virtual walk. Although the emphasis is going to be of this walk is going to be on the food side of this area, before focusing on the foodie side, I want to touch on a bit of history and a little bit about the neighborhood. Now today's walk will be uh, partly based uh, on the book, uh, Berkeley Walks, which uh, Janet Byron and I uh, got published in 2015 and the second edition came out in 2018. Our original publisher was uh, Roaring Forties. Um, they decided uh, to, to end their uh, publishing uh, operation, and we're we're really delighted that uh, as publisher we now have local uh, Heyday Books, uh, who will hopefully at, at some point, as appropriate, uh, bring out a, a further edition. Um, I would uh, point out, besides the 21 walks in the book, which have maps and photos and and so on, and there's an index and uh, architectural styles and architectural terms. Um, also on our website, which is www.berkeleywalks.com, you can usually find it by just Googling Berkeley, Berkeley Walks. Um, I've been putting up new walks. Um, if you go to the website, there's a new walk section and there's, in addition to the 21 walks in the book, there are 18 more self-guided uh, walks, each put into series of uh, three. So there's six series now, a uh, total 18 walks and I'm working on more and these are free. Uh, the new walks are free. They're PDFs you can download for free from the website and you can 
uh, print them out, or you can look on them in just about any electronic device, a, a laptop, a, a tablet, or a cell phone. Um, okay, well, let's look at where we're going today. Um, here is the, uh, the map of today's route. Um, you can see that uh, where that uh, circle with the arrow is, that's our starting point, which is uh, on Shattuck Avenue just before you get to Vine Street. And we're gonna go up, uh, we're actually gonna go up Vine first and explore a little bit. And then we're gonna explore the neighborhood. As I said, we're gonna go up here on uh, Shattuck, which switches over to Henry. And we're gonna go over towards uh, Live Oak Park and up as far as Eunice, and then come back around. And then we're gonna do the, uh, the gourmet ghetto uh, in earnest. But first we're gonna explore the history in the neighborhood a bit. Well, as far as history, um, in 1878, the steam railway that had come to what is now the downtown area two years earlier uh, was extended on Shattuck to a point near Rose Street. This spurred the development of the North Shattuck neighborhood uh, for new residents, including railway workers, and a commercial area grew up here as well. The photo is probably from around the turn of the previous century and is looking north on Shattuck towards the intersection with Vine Street and beyond. The building on the near left corner, which was in our opening uh, slide, um, is still there um, and not very much changed. There was at that time, well, there's a, there's a horse-drawn carriage in front, uh, a wagon in front, which you wouldn't see now. Um, at that time, there was a roof over the sidewalk, which is not there now. The building on the right near corner, um, this building is still there, although it's been significantly altered since then. Um, the building on the left far corner, which would be the northwest corner, that's that's gone. Uh, there was later a service station and then now a, a bank branch. Um, and there's a building you can just barely see here um, that is also gone, but we'll see it in the now currently, but we'll see it in the in the next photo. Um, so this is a photo we if you've gone up to Vine Street and looking up hill on Vine Street. Um, there's that building we mentioned that's been altered, but it's still there. Um, this building is gone, replaced by the one that supposedly has a gargoyle somewhere hidden in, under the awning in the corner, according to an earlier discussion we were having. And um, this is looking up Vine Street, um, and there's some Victorian houses here, which we're going to go, uh, some of them are still there, we're going to go explore momentarily some of those. Well, here's another picture that's from a fairly similar vantage point from the first picture that we saw with the steam train. This one is taken later, so there's an electric uh, commuter uh, rail car there. The, um, the building on the left doesn't have that roof over the sidewalk anymore. It looks pretty much like it does today. Um, the building on that far corner is gone and has been replaced by a Chevron station in this photo. Uh, we can't really see what's on the right side from this photo. Um, this is from the photos of uh, Louis Stein, who was the pharmacist for many years at the uh, Kensington Pharmacy on, on, on the Arlington and, and had amassed an amazing collection of historic photos of Berkeley as well as Kensington. Um, and uh, it's, it's great to have that collection around. Now, um, from the cars, uh, maybe somebody is even more expert on cars. To me, this is going to be maybe either very late 30s or sometime in the 40s uh, from the cars. Uh, maybe somebody later when we get to the, to the uh, Q&A. And by the way, the, the presentation will be well under an hour, so we'll have plenty of time for questions and comments at the end. Um, so uh, we're gonna continue with our walk. We're gonna go up to Vine Street. Uh, we're almost there. We're going to go up to Vine Street and we're going to turn right. We're going to go up Vine Street past the commercial buildings. We're going to come back to the commercial center a little bit later. Um, and just past Walnut, there's a couple of Victorians, uh, which are actually uh, side by side at 2155 and 2157 Vine Street. And they both date from 1899. Although they've been altered a little bit, um, they have uh, still a lot, they retain still a lot of their Victorian features, including the fish scale signal, shingles, um, the angled bays, um, the moderately pitched roof with, with lots of gables, uh, the double hung windows, and so on. 
if we continue a little bit farther up Vine Street to the corner of Oxford, uh, we come across this house. This is a picture from the front and a picture from the Oxford, which is on Vine Street, and a picture from the Oxford side of the same house. Uh, this is the Andrew Weir House, uh, which is a Victorian style house that dates from around 1890. Um, and Andrew Weir, uh, the original resident, was an early member of the uh, early trustee of the Berkeley School District. Um, this Victorian house has a spindle, uh, spindle railing on the porch and stairway. Um, it has squared bays here and here again. Um, and particularly on the Oxford Street side, there's a lot of ge geometric uh, ornamentation here, here uh, under the eave and a sunburst under the gable. Okay, well, let's go back down Vine Street to Walnut Street, and we're actually gonna turn left so that we're heading left on, uh, so we're heading south on Walnut Street. And a little ways along uh, is this rather impressive house at 50, 20, 1525 Walnut Street. Now, this is in what's called the Italianate style, which, um, is regarded as being before Victorian. As far as I know from the years, it's actually, it, it was popular in the, at least partly in the, in the reign of Queen Victoria, but it isn't really called properly Victorian architecture. It's called Italianate. Um, and some significant, the house has been altered and expanded, but some, some of the features remain such as this cornice uh, over the bay, um, the pilasters uh, between the windows, the fairly low pitch to the roof, um, the porch uh, design. These, these are features of the uh, Italianate style. Another one that you don't see particularly in this house, I think, I think it's in this window, is they often, often the tops of the windows had little arches on them. Well, this house, uh, besides being perhaps, it's 1878, so it may be the oldest house in the neighborhood. I, I'm not sure if not, it's certainly one of the oldest houses in the neighborhood, um, dating from, about the time that the, uh, the railroad came. Um, moreover, there is some history connected with the occupants of this house. From 1881 until 1915 or so, it was the home of Meldon Leroy Hanscom, who became city auditor. Uh, his daughter, Adelaide Hanscom Leeson, who is seen in the picture in the inset, the right here, was an important figure in the pictorialist movement in photography which gave photographs somewhat of the air of paintings. And here are a couple examples of her work. Um, you, you can assume that since they didn't have color photography then, these, these would have been hand colored. Um, and, and that's part of the pictorialist approach to photography. Um, if you go, if you look on the internet for Adeline Hanscom or Adam, Adeline Hanscom Leeson, uh, you'll see quite a wealth of, of her wonderful work uh, can, can be viewed on the internet. Um, then her photo illustrations for a 1905 edition of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, which has some fairly um, risque photos, uh, won national acclaim. Um, there were also other women in the pictorialist movement um, and, and important photography in Berkeley, um, including Laura Adams Armour, who lived on um, Arch Street, uh, not far from this location in a uh, Julie Morgan design house. Um, she was not only a photographer, but an artist. And she particularly gained fame for her 1920s uh, documentation of the Hopi and uh, Navajo Indians. Um, so there have been a lot of women trailblazers in Ber Berkeley, as we know, uh, including pictorialists, architects, uh, food revolutionists, and of course, our vice president elect, who went to elementary school here, and hopefully things will go smoothly at the inauguration next week after what happened this week. Hey, Bob, um, excuse me. Yes. Um, hey, oh, I'm sorry. I hate I got to too busy talking. Sorry, more people to admit. Yeah, okay. that's it. <laughs> okay. Just try to keep yes. an eye on that, I they're, guess. They're joining. One is still doing. We weren't able to set ourselves up as co-hosts. So. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, there's another one. Why does John keep coming in? Oh, all right. 
Okay, uh, sorry, I, I wasn't so quick to admit people. We <laughs> I'm trying to juggle two different things at once here. Um, any case, uh, we're going to go back to uh, Vine Street. We're going to turn left on Vibe now to Shattuck, but we're going to go north a little bit first. So we're going north on Shattuck and then curve over as uh, we follow the traffic onto Henry Street. And along Henry Street, um, on the other side are these um, the condominiums, which are uh, these houses, which are done in the, in the townhouse style. Um, I'm not sure if they're condominiums; they may be individually owned. Uh, but they're uh, brown shingle townhouses, which were built by Alan Wolfsey and Associates around 1874. Um, there's a number of kind of innovative housing developments on the north side, um, and. Uh, the, the townhouse style where you built the houses so they, they joined up with each other um, was very popular. Uh, we got another admission here. Uh, the, the townhouse style was very popular in some cities like San Francisco, New York, and so on. It never really caught on in Berkeley, however. But one thing is it's under the brown shingle. Now, brown shingle has been a very, siding has been a very popular, and there's a brown shingle style uh, has been very popular in Berkeley since the late 1800s and here even 1870s and even now sometimes brown shingles are popular. Um, the city of Berkeley tried to make it so that you would not be permitted to replace brown shingles with brown shingles when they wore out. Um, and a friend of mine who's an architect and lives in a brown shingle house objected very strongly and presented evidence on how they could be uh, reasonably fire safe. So uh, fortunately you're still permitted to put to replace your brown shingles in Berkeley. So if we continue on a little bit further, farther on uh, Henry Street, we come to uh, Codernice's Court. Um, and this was designed and developed around 1985 by Mui Ho of UC Berkeley. Uh, she thought she could have better control of the quality if she was the developer as well as the architect. And so there are nine uh, sort of townhouses, some are adjoining and some are, are, are separate like single family homes, but they're not on separate lots. They're all on one uh, nicely positioned on one lot uh, with landscaping and uh, the way that she uses the driveways and walkways and so on uh, to make a, a fairly attractive development on what was one large single family lot. Um, and they preserve, for example, this big uh, conifer uh, as part of the development. She also in the corner back there, um, there's a part of Codernices Creek that is uh, left uh, open. Uh, before it goes into a culvert. Um, here is a uh, picture of the development. Uh, I'm sorry, an illustration of the plan of the development. Uh, some of the some of the units it's showing the roof, and some of the units um, it's it's showing uh, a very rough idea of what the interior floor plan is like. And there's a picture of Mui Ho. Um, originally, uh, she went around to all the neighbors. Um, I met her at. We didn't. Uh, event which we toured um, infill developments in North Berkeley in 18, uh, 1994 um, for Greenbelt Alliance. And she, uh, she met us there and told us that uh, originally she went around the neighbors, they seemed to accept the development. And then one neighbor turned a lot of the other neighbors against the development and things got so nasty with threats that she actually ended up having to get a personal bodyguard. Uh, so there's, there's nothing quite so contentious as land development in in the city. Well, if we go back to uh, Berryman uh, at the corner, which is 1301 Henry Street, is the commune and winter home of Wavy Gravy's Camp Winter Rainbow, a circus and performing camp for all ages and abilities. Wavy Gravy, also known as Hugh Romney, was an announcer at the original Woodstock and a beloved clown, comic, writer and promoter of, promoter of social causes who had a Ben and Jerry's ice cream named after him. Um, at least once I know he ran for mayor of Berkeley. Um, did not make it though. Okay, well, let's see where we've gotten to. We started off here at Shattuck near Vine. We went up a uh, Vine to look at uh, some houses and to look at um, Italian house here on Walnut. Then we came back We've gone, uh, we followed as, the, as it curves over to become Henry Street. Uh, and we went as far as Codinice's uh, court, those townhouses which were here. We're now back here, the Hugh 
the, the uh, wavy gravy house is on this corner and we're gonna go up um, Berryman Street now. So on the left side of, of Berryman Street um, is this house, uh, which is um, a hands, uh, 2033. It's a handsome gray shingle house, which was designed by Henry Gutterson in 1916. If you know, um, if you know Rose Walk, um, just above Euclid, the houses that are there on Rose Walk, those were designed by Henry Gutterson in a little bit in consultation with Bernard Maybeck, who designed the actual uh, Rose Walk, the stairway and so on. Um, in any case, this house was the home of uh, Rebecca Howell, who was a leading figure. Uh, the house is from 1916, and she was a leading fig fixture in the Berkeley theater scene of the 1910s and 20s. Um, she reportedly also used the living room of this house uh, as an impromptu performance space. Now, next to this house and going around the corner is another interesting development. It's a live oak condominiums development from around 1979. Um, they're brown shingle and there are some new and some renovated older uh, structures. Um, there's, uh, I think, a couple of duplexes and others that are single family and they are on both sides of Codernese. Here's Codernese's Creek and there's a uh, residential structure here and also on this side. I think in the, this, the city of Berkeley probably would not you, allow you to build so close to a creek these days, but um, this was grandfathered. And it's really done a nice job. The creek is set down uh, from the houses. I think it's well enough down to hopefully not to be a, a flood threat, but it's, it's nice to have the, a natural creek as an amenity. Just across from this um, is Live Oak Park, um, which is actually Berkeley's uh, second oldest park um, in 1914, with the City Beautiful movement in full swing, um, Berkeley acquired this property uh, just when it was, uh, there was a proposed development here. Um, it has a park, uh, tennis and basketball courts, a community center, an art center, uh, a former barbecue fireplace, uh, a, pop a popular lawn area, and of course the creek flowing fairly naturally uh, with several bridges over it. Continuing up Shattuck, the last three houses on the left at 1210, 1208, and 1200 before, uh, Shattuck before Eunice were designed by Bernard Maybeck um, in his, accordance with his philosophy of building in harmony with nature. The last one at the corner with Eunice at 1200 was built for Isaac Flagg, a UC professor. Uh, and you can see it has uh, brown shingles and there's also uh, unpainted vertical uh, board siding on the on the upper part. Um, and he sometimes liked to put in Swiss chalet uh, features like this uh, balcony with the carved wooden uh, panels on it. Um, now from the 1920s, this house uh, was the home of uh, Dr. Clarence Wills, uh, a medical doctor, um, and uh, he had his office in downtown Berkeley. His daughter, Helen Wills, later Helen Wills Moody, launched her tennis career soon after moving here and became the first American woman to become an international sports superstar. Between 1922 and 1938, she won 31 Grand Slam titles, including eight Wimbledon championships and two Olympic gold medals. She was famous for her lack of emotion on the court, tremendous power and reclusive personality. Um, and partly because of that, she wasn't quite so popular with the people, but everybody was very impressed with her and uh, her ability. Um, I can remember my mother, who was born in 1970, telling me years ago that, oh, yes, Helen, Helen was moody. I, I knew about her. She was, she was very famous when, when my mother was growing up. Well, we're going to go back uh, south on heading back south on Shattuck. I, I couldn't resist just a couple months ago when I went by. Uh, there's this very cute house at 1219 Shattuck and with that uh, lovely uh, Japanese maple with its autumn tint in front, that was, uh, I just couldn't resist taking a photograph. Well, we're gonna continue on past that uh, to a more historically important house. Um, this is uh, past, uh, past Berryman and past the uh, Live Oak Park just a little bit. Um, this is at 30, 1335 Shattuck, 
and it's a colonial revival house from 1894, the Captain John Slater house. Um, he was a highly regarded sea captain and one of several uh, sea captains to settle in this neighborhood. Um, there's the Captain uh, Boudreaux house, um, which is on uh, Oxford right near that great big uh, Queen Anne Victorian on Oxford right near Cedar Street, which is also a, a Berkeley landmark. Um, and there's another one that's a Captain Maurer, I think. Anyway, there were, there were several sea captains in the area for whatever reason. Um, now this house um, is uh, from 1894. So it's probably the first, or I could, it could be the first, or definitely one of the first colonial um, revival excuse structures. Excuse me, I have a, a comment about the sea captains mm -hmm. uh, told to me by one of his sons. It was Captain Marston. Oh, Marston, okay. Marston, and the reason Otis Marston told me this, that they settled there was that they could see out the Golden Gate farther than <clears throat> you could see from Telegraph Hill. Uh -huh. And they would look at their spyglasses and see, and they could recognize the ships and know what commodities they were carrying and then rush to the commodities market to do trades. Right, yeah, because there, there is another guy, um, I think it's either Paul John or John Paul Moran, who was a ship's carpenter and built a couple of houses in Berkeley. And the house he built for himself, which is just off of Lincoln, has a little pop, it's a two floor house and then has a little pop up thing on the tower. And that's again, so he could get up there with his telescope and look out over the bay. So- Did he yes, build the house behind the Oscars? I'm sorry? There's a house just to the west of where Oscars used to be. And if you look at the uh, bracketry holding up the eaves, they're built to make take strain in three directions, which is oh. what a shipwright would do. There could be. I know there's one that's at the corner of, oh uh, gosh, I think it's, it's I think it's Francisco and and uh, Milvia. That's blue now. It used to be white. It has blue bottles in the windows. That's one. That's a one by Moran. It has his signature, which is ink. There's anchors uh, under on the uh, barge board under the eaves. Good. Okay. Well, that's an interesting point about the, the why the sea, sea captains came to this area. Um, in any case, um, this uh, colonial revival style um, became uh, pretty popular also in this neighborhood because it is the style that was most in vogue uh, after the Victorian. And there's a number of areas because that was a high growth period. Or, in Berkeley, there's a number of areas where you find a lot of uh, colonial revival houses, although they're, they're a little different than this particular early example. And the in, that's the inset photo is John Slater, and I should mention I, I pulled that off the Berkeley Architectural Heritage Association's website. Well, let's go on uh, left on Rose now, and then right on Walnut. So we're passing in front of the Jewish Community Center, which was formerly the Garfield Junior High School, a city landmark and on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, oh, I see there's some more people to admit here, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if people had to be waiting to get in. <laughs> I'm sorry if some of you just joining had to be waiting to get in. I'm, I'm kind of uh, having to juggle doing the presentation with checking the admissions. We are recording it, so okay. I'll try to announce how people yeah, can you can, you can You can get the first part um, from the recording. Um, so anyway, uh, the Garfield uh, Middle School, um, which I have a feeling would have back in those days, weren't they called junior high schools? They were in my day anyway. Yes. Maybe it was maybe it was also called middle school. Um, this was designed by uh, Ernest Cox Coxhead, who was a very uh, prominent Bay Area architect, and he lived in Berkeley and was a member of at least for part of the time was member of the Berkeley Hillside Club that that had a lot of influence on on architecture in the city. Um, and this uh, is a Berkeley City landmark, and it's also on the National Register of Historic Places. The, the design is from 1915. Okay, we're almost finished with the architecture. We'll get on to food in a second. Um, so on the uh, northeast corner of Vine and Walnut um, is the Berkeley Friends Meeting, which is a Quaker, Quaker meeting hall in a lovely brown shingle that fits well in the neighborhood. It was recently renovated and connected to the residence beside it. Um, it was originally the Wesley Methodist Episcopal Church built around 1911. 
now we are ready to return to the commercial area from the corner of Vine and Walnut as shown on the map. So we've done, we started here, we did, went up here once, and then we went all the way up here to Eunice and we've come back past the Garfield Middle School and here's where the Quaker Meeting Hall is and we're now here. So at Vine, um, on the southwest corner is this 1902 Colonial Revival commercial building. Before we get on to the other part, I have to say something about the architect because I, I did some research when I was working on landmarking another building. He was, design, was designed by William Wharf with two Fs, a Civil War veteran who came to the Bay Area and he became an architect late in life. Um, he lived to be over a hundred and until, I don't know, one of his, almost his final year, continued to go to Civil War reunions. Um, in any case, he worked in a number of different styles um, he did hundreds of buildings in, uh, in the Bay Area, particularly in San Francisco. Unfortunately, many of them were lost in the 1906 fire. Um, but he did uh, several buildings in Berkeley, in including the Masonic Building in downtown Berkeley, which is a, a city landmark. Um, in any case, um, you're going to tell me, okay, that's all nice, but this building has something else that makes it even more important than William Wharf being the architect. Um, and that is, of course, is that is the location of the original Pete's Coffee and still a Pete's Coffee. Uh, so Pete's Coffee and Tea was founded in 1966 at this location. Alfred Pete learned the coffee trade in his native Holland and he was a pioneer in the US gourmet coffee industry uh, among the first to roast beans different times for different flavors, um, different different strokes for different folks, I guess, uh, to sell a variety of coffee beans and to make coffee beverages to order. It was the model for Starbucks. And in fact, Alfred Pete was a mentor for the founder of that firm and the, star and the source of Starbucks original coffee bean supply. Uh, Pete's eventually expanded into a chain and after several changes of ownership was bought by a large German investment group, JAB Holding in 2012. You could argue that the gourmet ghetto really began with Pete's. And um, like some other places, such as Chez Panisse, uh, has had tremendous impact, uh, not just in Berkeley, but, but nationwide. Well, around uh, going in an L shape around that building um, is this uh, L shape is the Walnut Square. Uh, it's a complex of shops on two levels. Uh, done by Ronald Dean Senna in 1972. The combination of new and historic construction was, was considered fairly innovative at the time. Over the years, it's included various restaurants and food shops among its tenants. Now, as we go down Shattuck, uh, I'm sorry, down Vine towards Shattuck uh, on the opposite side set back from the street is the 1930 uh, pumping plant for East Bay Mud. Um, East Bay Mud had been founded in 1923, and this is pumping plant is from 1930. Um, subsequently, this station was no longer needed, and it is now uh, important for another liquid, uh, reasonably high quality, but not super expensive wine uh, called Vintage Berkeley. On the left side uh, uh, was until recently the co location of the Juice Bar Collective at 2114 Vine Street. In 2019, the worker-owned business closed after 42 years here in the Gourmet Ghetto. This small shop was also the original location of the cheese board for a few years. Currently, um, as shown in the lower right picture, it is fava, which emphasizes simple and fresh seasonal foods and started by two Chez Panisse veterans. So I'm guessing that means the, uh, the, the, the juice board collectives was, if it's 42 years and closed in 2019, that will be back to 1977 roughly, which we'll try and remember that for something just a bit later. Well, at Shattuck, let's uh, go right just a little to note that at this location in 1481 Shattuck, and it's the, would be the, there's two stores here and there'll be the one on the left, um, was the uh, one-time location of Coca-Cola. Um, Alice Medrick began preparing and selling those scrumptious truffles 
and other chocolates from her home in 1973. And in 1976, founded Kokola uh, with the first retail store at this location. I can remember often going there to buy some of the incomparable truffles as gifts. Okay, well, I ate a lot of them myself too, but they were, they were amazing. Um, by 1990, there were seven stores, including one on uh, Montgomery Street in San Francisco. Um, but a disastrous fire just before the Christmas selling season um, and major embezzlement by one of the employees um, forced uh, Atlas to, to close down uh, the Coca-Cola shops to, to our great chagrin. Um, but she has continued uh, to, uh, to write cookbooks. And uh, in a recent email comment, uh, Alice reminisced about being part of a movement uh, to in reinvent food and food shopping uh, in this country, and a time when there was very little truly high quality prepared, prepared food available for purchase. So quoting her, she went on to say, and there's a picture of course of, of Alice. Um, she went on to say, we transformed North Berkeley into a tiny piece of Europe, like a Paris neighborhood where people who knew or wanted to know good food could shop at small sh shops could, for the best of the best rather than simply going to the supermarket for the status quo. Alfred Pete was the elder statesman in the neighborhood. He preceded us by many years and was well established, but he appreciated all of the new young energy and creativity. Some of us were learning by doing. That was certainly true for me. Kokola was not a very polished act at first, and we were kind of figuring it out as we went, but the neighborhood, and it is still my neighborhood, was extremely welcoming and enthusiastic and quite forgiving of any less than professional rough edges. Berkeley, North Berkeley gave me, a self-taught pastry and chef and chocolatier with an idea, a chance to become a professional. Those were wild, wonderful days, usually much too long, not very organized and quite hard, but I still remember the thrill. We were creating a world of food in this country. Oh, and by the way, uh, someone pointed out, uh, and. Uh, informed me. Somebody pointed out on the uh, Facebook uh, side, Berkeley Historical Society, uh, about the food that um, the right side here uh, in the around the 1970s and 80s was salubrious natural foods. Uh, the, the the guy who pointed this out worked apparently worked there around 1976 to 78, um, and uh, the, the store was connected with uh, Jack Lalane. Who, uh, who grew up on uh, Spalding Avenue in Berkeley and graduated from Berkeley High School uh, and went on to build a fitness gym chain and promote physical fitness and exercise with the TV program, as well as emphasizing diet. So that's what was important for that uh, store, the salubrious natural foods. Well, just a little farther along is Saul's Deli, which moved to this location soon after its founding in 1986 by Saul Lichtenstein and his wife, Ginny. Um, it has recently changed hands as the original owners decided it was time to retire, but it remains a popular spot for Jewish specialties. Um, there is a strong emphasis on local organic fresh produce and humane treatment of animals as character as many of the, of the uh, people in this area. Okay, somebody else joining us a little late. Um, <laughs> And um, it was also pointed out that before Saul's, the, the pantry shelf deli was at this location. That predates my presence in North Berkeley. So uh, any case, be, beyond Saul's uh, is Massey's Pastries at 1469 Shattuck, founded here in 1997 by Paul and Marcia Massey. It is a European style patisserie where the owners take pride <clears throat> in the quality and artistry of their work including amazing wedding cakes. Supposedly, when visiting from Chicago, they were impressed by North Berkeley and Coca-Cola in particular, and eventually came to set up shop here. And here's Paul making one of those famous wedding cakes. We can also see how the original parklet, a parklet being a dining platform in a firmer parking space in front of Saul's, um, has increased to a whole row of outdoor dining and service areas during COVID. 
unfortunately, even outdoor dining is a kid have been prohibited for now, but uh, we hope that will be one of the first things to return. Um, going on back to Vine Street, okay, we, there's this building we saw at, the, at our opening slide that's on the southwest corner of Vine and Shattuck. Um, this is an 1891 Victorian building uh, designed and built by, uh, by Alpha of Alfonso H. Broad who designed and built many early schools and myriad homes and commercial buildings in Berkeley. It was originally a Kohl's hardware store. Then from 1921 to 1970, it was the capital market, housing a grocery store and butcher shop run by a family over two generations. From 1971, it was the produce center founded by Japanese American Ron Fuji with an emphasis on fresh local produce that fits in with the gourmet ghetto location. It was later under different, different ownership, um, still remaining the produce center. And then the space was taken over by the cheese board in 2018 for expansion of their business. Um, I wrote uh, the application to get this landmarked when I was a member of the Berkeley Landmark Preservation Commission. Um, and I uh, hope it will, this building will be, continue to be well taken care of. Um, it's a building that's been in the food business for a century now. Um, now this, I said the style is Victorian. It's partly Victorian and partly colonial revival. This, this part here, this turret uh, is definitely uh, Victorian. Um, this uh, feature here is a little bit uh, colonial revival. Um, and uh, wh whereas the, uh, the fish scale sh shingles are Victorian, uh, but this, this little entry here with the columns, this is another of the sort of colonial revival theory. So, so it's one of those buildings you call transitional. Okay, well, next to that building is the uh, cheese board. Um, they actually started, as we noted earlier, on Vine Street um, in 1967, okay? Um, and the founders, Hug and Meg Avedisian, sold the business in 1971 to employees who together formed a worker collective uh, that continues to this day uh, about uh, 50 years later. Um, they emphasize a shared work ethic, high standards, and decisions reached through democratic debate. In 1975, they moved to this space on Shattuck near the Produce Center and became known for baked goods as well as the huge cheese selection. So 1975, they moved here from that space on Vine which then around 1966, 76, 77, uh, became the Juice Bar Collective. Well, in 1985, they began offering pizza to customers. Uh, initially, it was something that they prepared for themselves as a lunch dish uh, with, they made the, the dough and then they got the, uh, the, uh, the toppings from the produce center next door. Uh, but then they offer, started offering their pizza to uh, the public uh, in 1985, um, and um, that building is, it's actually kind of two doors. There's one, there's one intervening building between uh, the cheese board and the, and the pizza collective. Well, people wait in, in line uh, for pizza at both the lunch and the dinner time, um, and they can be purchased by the slice to eat right away or a whole pizza a whole pizza to finish baking at home uh, with a different vegetarian pizza featured each day. This is, of course, is a pre-pandemic photo. Well, will we be back to this someday? <laughs> we hope. <laughs> across from the street, across the street from that uh, is the Epicurious Garden, which opened in 2004. Um, this was a 1916 movie house. Um, it was a furniture showroom and then an electronics retail store, Dale Sanford TV, which um, I can remember that part. Um, and uh, Sohail uh, Madaresi and completely renovated it to create an emporium with gourmet takeout foods, a restaurant, uh, Chinese Imperial Tea Court, and a cooking school. Also on the east side of the street is Chez Panisse with its huge Aracardia tree in front. Um, and that's of course was done in a converted house. Um, 
as far as I can tell anyway. Alice Waters, coming out of the political activism of the 1960s, founded the restaurant in 1971, which emphasized fresh local ingredients and is credited with inventing California cuisine that has had impact well beyond California. Alice wanted to change the way Americans farm and eat food. Many former chefs such as Jeremiah Tower uh, went on to found other restaurants with a sim similar emphasis. And uh, my niece lives in Birmingham and I visited Birmingham um, and a couple of times went to a restaurant called the Highlands Restaurant um, where the, the, the owner and chief chef is Frank Stitt, who's another uh, Chez Panisse alumni. And he was, his thing was to adapt uh, California cuisine to, to the South. Um, and I actually have his cookbook, which has some, some good recipes in it. Um, anyway, uh, also uh, Stephen Sullivan and um, started uh, Acme Bread. He's another Chez Panisse alumni. And Richard Mazera of Chez Panisse opened the Cesar Tapas restaurant next door in 1998. Um, the Chez Panisse Northern California Regional Dinner began in 1976. And then the Upstairs Cafe opened in 1980. Um, there have twice been fires, uh, a kitchen fire in 1982, after which the wall was removed to make an open kitchen, and another fire in 2013, after which uh, it was painstakingly restored. Um, sadly, it is closed except for limited takeout, but hopefully will reopen someday. Um, the beautiful graphics work of David Lance Goins has also always been very important at Chez Panisse as well. Um, years ago, we went regularly to share Panisse for special occasions, but as prices kept rising, reservations became more difficult and we stopped eating meat. Um, we had stopped going, but we've been a few times to the cafe upstairs, which is a la carte, and we were scheduled to have dinner there on last March 16th. Um, and um, we got a telephone call from Chez Panisse saying, sorry, they were going to have to close. Uh, that day. And shortly after that, we got the news that Shelton Place started. Uh, so <laughs> we, we just missed by a day getting a nice dinner at the, the Cafe and Chez Panisse. Well, I sometimes wonder if you can change the way the rest of the world eats with the kind of pricing at Chez Panisse, but I tremendously admire what Alice Waters did in helping found the edible schoolyard at MLK Junior Middle School. Um, the, app, the emphasis is not just on planting and growing things in the garden, but cooking and eating them together and integrating it all into the overall school curriculum. Um, we were told uh, when we, I was on a, a dose led tour there several years ago um, that there's a lot of kids at the school that didn't even really seem to have the experience of sitting down and eating a meal together. Um, they were used to just having things you got out of the fridge or, or a, a convenience store or something. Um, in any case, it's great to see this being emulated at other schools here and elsewhere. And definitely the idea of emphasizing fresh local ingredients has, that, that Alice uh, Champion has had a big influence uh, in many places. Um, and here's the picture of Cesar's, uh, which is uh, next to Chez Panisse. And uh, it's one of the many sad things about the COVID-19 era that so many restaurants are closed or only offering takeout or a limited amount of dining, outdoor dining table. And even that's been closed again. Um, unfortunately, many restaurants have not been able to survive financially and have closed for good. But uh, there's actually, some, uh, strange enough, there's some new play, food places opening up. They have to emphasize just takeout, takeout initially though. Well, moving further south on Shattuck, we come to a supermarket with a history. The Berkeley Buyers Club, uh, formed in 1936 during the Great Depression, evolved a little later into the Consumers Cooperative of Berkeley or Berkeley Co-op with its first store on Shattuck farther south and then in 1937 on University Avenue. At one point, it, at one point it grew to 12 stores with annual sales of $83 million and over 100,000 members, um, the largest cooperative of its kind. One of those 12 stores was at this location. However, a sharp political division on the board uh, going back many years, as well as overexpansion and inability to get concessions from its union led to decline and final collapse in 1989. The store then became an Andronico's 
which also suffered from overexpansion and went through changes in ownership until Safeway bought it and called it Safeway. And then again, it's Andronico's community market. In autumn, North Shattuck is also a great place to see autumn leaves. Um, there are both uh, sweet gum seen here lining the street and the and uh, uh, ginkgo trees, which are farther down with the, their brilliant yellow colors. Um, I, in the Bay Area, we're kind of lucky. We have this climate where autumn, you know, and and spring kind of merge. Uh, you can you can still find a few sweet gums with in beginning of January with colors on them, and uh, you can find uh, right now. You can of course find magnolias and camellias and other things starting to bloom. So I think here winter is kind of like an overlay between autumn and spring rather than being a completely separate season. Um, if we just get some more rain this year, we'll hopefully have a good spring. Okay, well, if uh, we're, we're virtually at Cedar Street. So if we look up Cedar Street um, to the left, up the uphill direction, uh, we see uh, Gregoire's, which I'm, pardon my French, I didn't take French. If it was Italian, I could say it, but um, anyway, it was started in 2002 by French trained chef and owner Grégoire Jacquet, um, who is seen in the lower right photo as, as a high end artisan takeout restaurant. Um, it became very popular, um, including its famed cr crispy potato puffs with a changing menu of natural organic ingredients uh, sourced from many places. The takeout emphasis has probably been a big plus for them in the COVID 19 era because they only had a a couple tables, I think. If we look down to the right on Cedar, Cedar by the, uh, uh, the other direction, um, is the local butcher shop, which opened in 2011, devoted to seasonal, locally sourced, sustainably res fresh meat. So here's this, this emphasis, um, again, in, in the food, um, the way the food, uh, where the food comes from and, and how it's presented. Um, the butchers are supposedly trained chefs uh, ready to help customers with cooking suggestions and recipes, and they do custom cuts and make pate sausages and deli meats in house, as well as a sandwich of the day, and they do delivery. Well, taking just a minute or two more, if we go down uh, farther, we come to uh, Poulet um, on the, on the uh, left or east side of Shattuck. Um, and this was opened in 1979 as a gourmet delicatessen and caterer, this caterer that specializes in chicken dishes as well as salads, sandwiches, desserts, and side dishes. It also sells some grocery items, grocery items and beverages, including wine. There are a few small tables, but the emphasis is on takeout and delivery. Um, and new ownership took over in 2018. And opposite on the right side, uh, was the former location of Virginia Bakery, which opened in 1934 by German immigrants Ewald and Elsa Poschel. Um, then the er Erdmann family owned it from 1953 until it closed in 2018. Um, it was beloved for its custom-made cakes, its pastries, and cookies. Uh, we went through a period where we often bought their strawberry delight cakes. The lower left photos shows Anne and John Erdmann shortly before the closing. Well, let's head back to our starting point. So we've got down this far and we're not very far from our starting point. Um, as I mentioned, this walk is uh, partly based on one that's in one of the 21 walks in our Berkeley Walks book, although that walk actually explores more of the neighborhood and doesn't have quite so much emphasis on the, on the food side. Um, well, thank you very much for all your attention. We now have time for questions and uh, can I, oh, I just have for me to unmute all. You can you can mute yourself if you'd like to. And why don't you stop question. sharing your screen, and then people can okay. open. Up. We can see more faces. Okay, good. And um, um, oops, if you if you open the participants list, uh, down at the bottom you should see a place where you can raise your hand uh, digitally. Um. And there's also a chat. Right. Yeah, maybe you could uh, look at the chat and comment. Oh, everybody's still muted. 
I'm not. But, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, somebody's pointed out that uh, Adelaide Hanscom Lisa and that Hanscom actually has an E on the end. Oh, not, okay. Not right. No, I checked. I went to Wikipedia and it's. Oh, it is. No, I think I'm pretty sure that's right because I've looked her up on the internet. Uh, Moody was the model for Diego Rivera's mural in mm -hmm. SF Stock Exchange Club in the financial district. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I think she's also in the one at, uh, at uh, San Francisco State, the yeah. uh, American City, Unity. Yeah. City College. City College, sorry. I get yeah. mixed up. Uh, Ju Juice Bar Collective member was Wendy Yoshimura, now a great watercolor painter and former as a Simone's Liberation Army. Okay. Uh, Oh, well, yes, we didn't mention that CVS was originally a lucky supermarket and then he was at various drugstores. I think, was it Tom's? No, Bill's, Bill's Drugs and Long's Drugs. Yeah. Yes, that's right. It was originally a supermarket. Yes. Um, oh, Andronicos bought Safeway. No, no, no. Andronicos didn't buy Safeway. Uh, <laughs> Andronicos is much smaller. Safeway bought Andronicos. Yeah. Um, I, 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 what I, happened I, is Safeway bought uh, Andronicos. And they called it Safeway Community Markets. And then they decided the Andronico's name had more, it, it, it made it more a sort of separate thing from, from Safeway. And so they changed it back to Andronico's Community Market. But I don't believe the Andronico's family is still involved. Yeah. Think of the waste of all the graphics and signs and things that Safeway probably threw away. They can't <laughs> use that name anymore. And then they yeah, just they keep remodeling and remodeling. Then you can't find anything. Um, I'd like yes. to make a comment about yes. the uh, the first photos that you showed of uh, entering Berryman Station, that uh, the building <coughs> behind where the gas station eventually was, I believe that's the original firehouse number four. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it was then like, a was it a Chinese restaurant or something? Is that the one? Uh, no, no, it's it was torn down to oh, right. create the parking lot for the bank or whatever. Oh, okay. Oh, oh I see. But yeah. it was it was firehouse number four before it moved over uh -huh. to Hopkins or whatever that train. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, Jackie Ensign has raised her hand. Um, okay. you, need, you need to unmute yourself, Jackie. Usually at the lower left of your thing, you can find the thing. That you it was, um, it was also, there was a spring. And I think that was one of the reasons that, that they built the firehouse there. And there was um, on the side of Safeway there. Um, remember, are you aware of that, Chuck? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there was, and there, was there, was that, there was the old well there that it was, went back to the Peralta days. So. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. Thank you. Well, you did, before you had East Bay Mud, you had to have, a very local water supply. I mean, after all, UC was founded on Strawberry Creek, so they had water. <laughs> yeah, I'm ahead. sure a lot of you remember the mid-block crossing on Shattuck Avenue that got eliminated. Um, there used to be a bridge there over Schoolhouse Creek. Oh. I okay. saw it on a, on a very old map. Schoolhouse Creek then dips off to the southwest and goes behind where where the cheese board and and the produce market were it's it's a shame that so many creeks have been culverted uh Cordernese creek is the most open but i mean strawberry creek goes in a culvert from the uc campus all the way till it comes out at the house of my co-author janet byron on uh, uh, next to her house on uh, just on Ulster way just off of sacramento and goes for a couple blocks and then goes into culvert again until it gets to the bay but um, you can find little vestiges of like Marin Creek up in the hills near Marin Street. And I'm pretty sure that below the, uh, below the Alameda, the reason that, that uh, initially going down, uh, Marin has these uh, sweeping curves that is following the old creek bed, uh, the creek now being in a culvert of Marin Creek. And the houses actually go up on the hill a little bit on each side. There's a there's a wonderful the um, Oakland uh, Museum put out a wonderful map of all the creeks in the East Bay that I have a copy of. So uh, you could go around and find out where. And sometimes finds you know creeks in somebody's yard, or sometimes it's only in a culvert. I'd like to comment on your early photograph with the cars in it. 
Uh huh. Yes. Uh, it, it could not have been taken before 1941. Okay. I, I'd have to see again to identify anything. But yeah, the more it looks, I thought it was 40s cars rather than 30s. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Probably not after World War II. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I think so. Um, somebody else had a. I can't see everybody's faces. Jackie, did you have something? Yeah. Um, the uh, yellow tiled um, structure above CVS, uh, that building was Lucky's. Then at one point it was part of the co-op and uh -huh. then it was Bill's yes. and then Long yes. and CVS, that yeah. building said. And, yeah. and the top lot I remember as being the dime store as a kid, that was my favorite place. What, what, was, what became the dime store or what was the dime store? Ocola. Oh, uh-huh, uh-huh, Coca-Cola. Um, oh, I see. Uh, somebody said there was a lot of re custom resistance to the Safeway name and they were hoping call it Andronicles again would help with that. Unfortunately, they did not fix the fact that food shifted towards junk. But <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I've always wondered about the tower, something like a stack of three or four rectangular open windows on top of the current CVS. Do you know anything about the design idea behind it? That is Raymond Lowy. Lowy. I think that was that was a lucky sign at one time. Yeah, I think it was, it was a, a sign for the store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, somebody pointed that. CVS Tower was it. over. What was the idea behind that? It? Was, that was the style for a while in the fifties or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Michael. Michael. Yeah, I believe, I believe that that was a Raymond Lowy design. For it was supposed to represent three square meals a day, but Berkeley had height limits, so they only got two. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wow, that's a, an interesting little piece of trivia to add to the block. John, did you have a comment? Oh, you're, you're muted, John, I think. Maybe the lower left. Oh, uh, uh, he's not. Go ahead. I had a little tip as to uh, the uh, structure of both coffee. Uh, my grandmother there was the first woman dentist in Berkeley. Ah. 1999. And her dental office was about east. Uh huh. And uh, there's still a dentist there. Uh huh. He has her uh, picture on the wall and her uh, foot operated grill. Oh. Uh -huh. Okay. So you can add that to your. Uh, oh, Another one of the trailblazing women in Berkeley. Yeah. Uh -huh. And and what wasn't Louis Stein's father the the owner of that building? Or yeah, Chuck is nodding. I well, at least Louis Stein worked work as a pharmacist in that building. I don't know whether his father owned it. Or not. Oh. Uh -huh. they, um, his father had a, a butcher shop in that was. Yeah. At various locations, uh, including that corner, I think, or just over from that corner. Uh, Jackie. Oh, I can't see, I can't see everyone on the screen. So if you, if you have a question, you can also put it in chat. We're kind of looking at chat as well. Oh. Uh, All right. The Jewish Community Center, um, that was a junior high. They didn't junior. have middle school when I yeah. was here. That's what I thought. I mean, somewhere there was a middle school. When I was, no, no, not nothing. It was called junior high. Chuck, you're agreeing with me? Yes, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. And the other, when I went to Oxford school, down the street at that school was another elementary school. I don't remember what it was called, but it was an elementary school. Then it was a school administration building. And then it was the JCC. By the chronology, right? I think. Yeah, I think between the between it becoming the administration building and Garfield, it was for a while. It was a, a kind of a special elementary school, which Cal education students sort of worked there. So it was like an experimental school. Oh, I thought Cal that the um, what do they call it? The Arts Magnet School, the one on Milvio. That used to be Whittier. Yeah. yeah, but I think I thought that was founded as a Cal uh, 
you know, experimental school, model school. The JCC was the um, school district headquarters before yeah. it became okay. the JCC. Yeah. But before it was a school headquarters, it was for a while that, that elementary school. But anyway. That, that, yeah, it was the, an alternative school before. I agree with you. But I was just saying right before that it became the JCC. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Steve, did you have a question? You need to unmute yourself probably. The lower left. If you click on the little red thing at the lower left, you can yeah. unmute. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned the townhouses on on the transition from Shattuck. On, on Henry Street, yes. And and you said they were from 1875, and that's really surprising. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I say 18. I meant 19. <laughs> so I, was, I wanted to make sure that I was yeah, 1975, I, right? I know because we have think we had things from both 1800s and 1900s there. So I'm sorry if I said the wrong thing there. Yeah, oh, 1975. Right? 1975. Thank you for for that. Sure. Uh, Garfield School. I wanted to mention uh, moved to uh, what is and was was <laughs> the building that is now Martin Luther King Jr. Right. Middle School was Garfield Junior High School when it was first built in the 20s. I mean, when I went to school, they had junior high schools, not middle schools. So, yeah. you know, but somewhere I, I, I said that because somebody wrote down that oh, it was previously Garfield Middle School, but I think they meant Garfield Junior High School. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I'd like to mention oh, that the, somebody piece. said, uh, the, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'd like to mention that the original Pete's didn't just sell coffee. We used to walk there with our mother because he roasted peanuts in that roaster of uh -oh. his. So we would buy paper bags of roasted peanuts. And then he also sold these wrapped like hunks of Ghirardelli chocolate that had just been whacked off some kind of gigantic forms. And so they were just odd weights of chocolate. So nobody in our family drank that coffee, but we walked there all the time as a family to get peanuts and chocolate. That's great. Uh -huh. I think one story is that he actually wanted to start a tea store, but there weren't that many people in Berkeley buying tea, so he went into coffee. Yeah, but I mean, he also, it was a Pete's coffee and tea, so he also sold tea. Yeah, yeah also tea, but, but he found he couldn't make it if he just sold tea, so he added coffee. Now somebody mentioned, don't forget Lenny's Meats. I don't know if somebody want to come in on, I don't yeah, know. I don't remember I don't, Lenny's Meats. Yeah. Where, yeah I, um, I saw when in Lenny's Meats became, Lenny's Meats became a, oh God, was it a bagel place for a while? Anyway, when when they were redoing that and the facade was stripped off and it said the green spot was painted on the facade. And I don't know anything about that, but it's just interesting to see an old business revealed and then disappeared. Somebody is asking if the, um... A fabulous mansion, Al Albina, was also a ship captain home. No, no, that was uh, that was Michael Curtis. Well, that was, that was part of a development by a man named Michael Curtis. Al Albina, Albina was the stage Albina name of his Albina wife. was the stage name of uh, M. B. Curtis's wife. Oh. Yeah. Um, and he sold that house to uh, um, another actress, I think, the Albina house. Well, the house, the, the uh, I don't know whether you're talking about uh, MB's house or the Luder's house. The Luden's house, I, yeah. Uh, I think the Luder house, Albert Luder was not a ship captain, but I don't know much about him. Uh -huh. Somebody also said we didn't mention the, I couldn't cover everything, the yeah. pig by the tail charcuterie. Oh, where where was that uh, located? That's uh, that's where the uh, pizza, the cheese board pizza part is oh. now. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, it's mentioned in the uh, page about. Um, oh, okay. About the gourmet ghetto yes. chronology. Right. Yeah. I just. Right. <laughs> I couldn't include everything. It was a long. Uh, uh, just it when when to... we got got to, to Berkeley, that was one of the places. That you, you know, the food revolution was happening. Yeah. Uh -huh. and I think that's where Alex Medrick first sold her uh, truffles. That sounds right. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah, that's what Lenny's was, I think, became the truffles afterwards. Right. Oh, oh. 
So where do you think Lenny's was? I was trying to remember what came after Lenny's, but yeah, I, I still little... had my Lenny Leonardo da Michi t-shirt. Shop where it also could have been part of with the, 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 there's two shops in one storefront with the with the doors side by side and the facing of the left side was the clip a lot which we confirmed with Alice was night was it was the number 80 and 81 was it 1981 no. I think one of the first two numbers I, I think Saul's now operates or now is occupying what was two stores before. And I think one of them may have at one time been, been uh, Lenny's. At one time, I, was only I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. I believe that too. And then it became, I don't know, Baskin Robbins and then bagels and then yeah. got reintegrated into Saul's. We yep. never you had a Baskin about... Robbins. We never had a Baskin Robbins on chat. Okay, there was somebody. There was, um, that was, when I was, was a kid, was... there was a Baskin Robbins. It was a bit there for about 10 years. There was a, a there was Vivoli's or something on Vine that was a um, Italian you know, place. Gelato. But there never was an ice cream on Shattuck since at least 66 when I was on this side of town. Yeah, from about 75 to about mid 80s. Mm, I don't remember Baskin Robbins, but maybe I forgot. And I've lived in the neighborhood all that time. Yes, there was, because those of us who could not afford Vivoli's got Baskin Robbins. <laughs> oh, exactly. okay. So, there have been several uh, questions about uh, the Garfield Junior High. Um, and somebody pointed out University Elementary School uh, 1922 to 23 at 1414 Shattuck, a building originally Garfield Junior High. In right. later years, the site of the Berkeley Unified School District's headquarter building. So, um, well, if the building was 1915, I guess that would mean just from 1915 to 1922, it was Garfield Junior High School? Or is it... Yeah, I think, I think it was too small. And, and for a while, the, the Garfield even had to rent some space in some of the office buildings well, somewhere on, 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 on Line Street. So they needed a bigger, a bigger Okay, campus. so 1915, 1920, it was Garfield Junior High School. Then it was uh, University Elementary School for a couple of years. And yeah. then it was uh, Berkeley Unified School District's headquarters. headquarters. Uh, I don't know when that when they moved out. Uh, Does this, anyone this know anything about the... Uh, the building that Saul's is in because the the ceiling, the roof is supported with no trusses. It's arches, it's a big doming structure, but it, I think the biggest piece is six feet long. It's a really fascinating structure. I'm sorry, which is this? For Saul's. Saul's. Oh, Saul's. Okay. So it's almost as if it was built to be a theater or something originally. And somebody uh, commented it would, uh, be neat to see a, se a session like this about the old train line on Shattuck, uh, which came up uh, from Oakland. I think it came up at line, didn't it? John knows this pretty well. Uh, uh, there, there were there were two systems. There was the there was the Southern Pacific had a had a local um, train line, and then the and then the key system. Yeah. And I think originally yeah, that I, originally the tunnel was was a Southern Pacific. Train and then when it stopped their trains, then the key system used it. So, I, but I the think, Southern Pacific came was a steam train originally, right? But then it, then it, then it switched over. Then it, then it switched over to electric. Then it yeah. faded them out. But the key system continued with it with it, with electric trains until the 1950s, at least until some of them. But, but I it think it's the Southern Pacific that really helped the development of of North Shattuck. Right. In, it, in, it was so the one that built the. Uh, uh, Moved to the 1878 up to up to Vine, and, but, but it's so. wide. I mean, Shattuck is such a wide street because you had steam trains yeah. down the middle of the street, and then you had, you know, wagons and and then cars, yeah. um, and then you also had at one time I think you had both. Was it wasn't there both a streetcar and um, steam train on on Shattuck, the key route and the Southern Pacific? Well, it, it, at downtown Berkeley, um, both downtown. the key, key system and the Southern yeah. Pacific both ran trains. And both electric trains eventually, which is why that the downtown part of Shattuck is so. But I think only one of them, 
had an electric train that came all the way up to North Shattuck and through the tunnel to Solano. And originally, I think it was the Southern Pacific electric train, and then the key system took that route over. And then, yeah. then they ended and then turned the tunnel into it. Yeah. Um, and the, but there was also, I'm going to get the computer. One, there was Southern Pacific, um, I think was on California and the key route on Sacramento, or I'm getting yeah. that. Yeah, one of that, yeah. And anyway. what was it that went up um, between Arch and between Spruce and Arch? There's an alleyway on Rose that used to have a streetcar run on it. And I can't remember what ran on that. But the one that came from California, if you go on Rose Street, you'll see that there's actually what was actually that there's this kind of concrete railing and beneath was actually that the, the um, it, it, there's a hill there and the train tunneled under that and then it went, it kind of curved through and it went behind, you know, somebody's showing us a photo there um, of, of the trains. It went behind what is now the shops where there's the uh, the country teas and coffee and all those shops along Hopkins Street there. So if you go to the end of the building where the uh, where the liquor shop is and you walk back the alley, you see at that end, it's very, very narrow because the street was curving around to get uh, onto uh, Hopkins Street. And the other one uh, on Monterey, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're in Monterey and then Calusa, and then when we I think Hopkins Street up to um, what is it, Henry Street, and through the. Getting tunnel. back to Shattuck and stuff, how long was the plumbing store there that the Bentons owned? You know that Mrs. Benton worked in it. Yeah, well, I mean, I've had Pete as my plumber for a number of years, and it wasn't that many years ago that I used to call him. His mother at the store answered it. It's not. And then, I, then, then the cheese board took took that building over. Yeah, maybe yeah. what 10, 10, 10 or twelve years ago, something. Like that. Yeah. At yeah. most, because Mrs. Benton insisted on going on even when she was in her nineties. I'd see. Yeah, it was yeah. called University Plumbing. She and lived on Milvia, up near where Milvia hits Yolo, sort of right when you make the turn and you're coming back. Yeah, no. just, just, just Michael, I want to know what's the photo that you're showing us. Okay, this was taken waiting for the train. You can see the wire overhead for an electric train. It was taken the 1400 block of Shattuck Avenue. The uh, young girl, that's my mother. This was taken about 1920. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay, I wanted to show a couple pictures too. Uh, I want to put in a plug for membership in our, oh, is this going to work, in the Berkeley Historical Society. Hold it in front of you. Hold it in front of you. Doesn't talk. Uh, oh, well. To get rid of the fake background. You have to turn off your background. Yeah, okay, hold on. <laughs> or go on talking. <laughs> We're all learning. Okay, there it is. This. Okay. The, we, we now publish a 12 page newsletter with color and um, membership in the Berkeley Historical Society is only $25 for individuals. And in the um, fall issue, we had, uh, we featured pictures of that Shattuck and Vine intersection. Yes. yes. Three different uh, times in history on the back cover. And in the winter issue, we featured that uh, amazing house on Albina that you can barely see from the street, but uh, this is from the, from the sky. <laughs> wow. Oh. And uh, it what was part that? of the Peralta oh, that's the, uh... process. That's the Peralta Park Hotel. Oh. That, uh, the and Albina house actually got greatly expanded um, by these renovated. Tom, what's his name, lived there for some decades. He passed away just a few years ago. My, uh, Friend of mine, it lives just a couple of houses away from there on Alpina. I guess but it's expanded, <laughs> kind of glorified that house on Alpina. But it's it was, I mean, the original part of it was one of the about a dozen uh, Victorian houses that were built together with the hotel um, by uh, by what's his name, the, uh, Curtis. Michael Curtis. It's yeah, more Curtis, by Curtis. Maurice Curtis. Um, and I think there's. What, there's about four or five of the Victorian houses still survive in the neighborhood. 
Yeah, like like a, a, couple of them on Hopkins. A, a guy named Richard Schwartz has written a book yes. about that about that man and yeah, it about, people thought about that development. And, and yeah. Yeah, and it was an amazing hotel, but it they didn't get enough people. The the development, you know, ended up uh, failing and uh, that became the school. And unfortunately the school eventually tore it down to replace it with a more modern building. So we don't have that neat old Victorian building anymore. It's too bad. This is where St. Mary's uh, College High School yeah. is now. Well, I just want to say from my standpoint, Berkeley Historical Society is, is such a great place to do research. I've gone there to look up the in the, in the old city directories. Before phone directories, they had a directories of just addresses to look up where did famous people live um, so we can identify the places, the walks, and um, the great photo collection they have and, and other resources. and. And of course the exhibits, but I'm glad that you're able to put on, in these hard times, you're able to put on this fascinating um, food exhibit. I think it's well worth, I, I read through it all of it and it's, it's really fascinating. I think the next one will be um, about African-Americans in Berkeley, part, part two, and it'll be partly about businesses owned by African-Americans. Um, and we're gonna do it online also. Um, and... Yeah, so our, our website is berkeleyhistoricalsociety.org in case you wanna check us out further. Um, we're just about out of time, but Jackie, did you wanna make one more comment? Just one quick question. The um, Southern Pacific train as a kid, we call it the red train and it went out to the Oakland Mall. And I can remember taking a ferry from the Oakland Mall over to the Ferry Building. And then um, after that, uh, when the bridge was built, uh, the, um, what was it? Key Chuck, train, uh, key train. Anyhow, we could take the train all the way over. The what? Anyhow, we could take the train from uh, North Bray Station, which is the bottom of Terrace Mall all the way over to San Francisco with a stop at Treasure Island. So that I remember. Uh -huh. yeah, it's too bad we don't have that still. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, Bob, what was the name of the movie theater? Um, and I, I know what the movie theater you mentioned was where uh, the Epicurious Garden is now. Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know the name, sorry. What was the movie theater? Apparently, 1916. Okay. I read somewhere. I wasn't yeah. here to verify that. But we don't know what the building that Saul's is in was built originally. Another research project for you, Bob. <laughs> Somebody else would like us to do a session, a, a session on the trains. Yeah, I find that interesting. I know we yeah. have some some people in Berkeley Historical Society are very knowledgeable about the trains. Is Buzz one of those? Okay. So I, know, I, know. I know Phil Gale is, but you Phil Gale. He has done uh, walking. Yeah, to, right. He has done uh, walking. Talk to him about. Asked, is there a condensed history of the train lines through Berkeley? I, I don't know. I kind of find things here and there. I think there's, there is a history of of the key system, which yeah. includes a lot of that Berkeley history. But it's to of the, the whole system, not just about Berkeley. Is is that a book or? or yeah, it's a book. I can't. It was a guy who used to work for the Chron. Who used to be the transportation reporter for the Chronicle, whose name I can't remember now. But uh, he wrote it maybe in the eighties. By the way, a few years ago, I read a book by a guy who was, I think, for a while, like the uh, public spokesman, public relations, whatever guy for Bart. Yeah. about the history of BART and how that yeah. got built. That's a fascinating story as well. And what happened in Berkeley, the battle to put it underground. Uh, it's, it's really, that's a very good book as well, if you're interested. What's the name of the book? The one about BART? Um, yeah. Probably if you do a sort of Google search, do a search. You know, history of BART, you'll find it. I, yeah. I, I probably have it somewhere, but I can remember the name. Don't worry about it's it. It's written by the guy who was the PR person for BART, yeah. their, their okay. public relations man. He had access to the history. Yeah, and then, well, you know, it, the problems they had with the under, you know, putting the tube under the bay and so on. Yeah. The, um, the, story the key the system way, book more. that I think you're thinking of is called Key System Gallery by a guy named James H. James H. Harrison. 
Yeah, I'm thinking of a different one, I think. But anyway, well, this is this that, is photographic, could... photographic yeah. with a lot of information in it. Yeah, well, I'm, yeah. When I'm thinking of it, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was the he was a Chronicle reporter, and I would recognize the name if you said it. So I know it wasn't Harrison, but anyway, there are books about the key system, and it would include Berkeley in it, but it's yeah, a broad well, system. And the earlier train systems, there's certainly a lot of information on the web. I guess if you just Googled uh, East Bay train history or something, you, you find more than enough, I think. Well, thank you. I will become a member of the Historical Society for Research, family research. OK. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks so much. Thank everyone. you, Bob Johnson, for the wonderful uh, presentation. And um, yeah, we can all applaud, even if you can't hear us. Thank you for being thank such you. a great audience and with all your questions and comments. <laughs> um, okay. Bravo. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to come up with another program on trains. And, did did and we stop recording? We're, we're still awesome. recording. I uh, guess it's still recording. Oh, also, we're going to try to have Narcy David give a, a an online presentation right. about um, restaurants back in the day before the the gourmet ghetto emerged. Okay. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye. I'll hit stop recording now. <laughs>